Let your rain pour down. Let your rain pour down. Let your rain pour down over me. Showers from above, falling down in love. Very welcome. I'm Michelle from Mystery Ministries. This is our second episode regarding depression. I'd like us to open in prayer, so if you could just close your eyes with me. Thank you, Father. Father, we just want to honor you for today. We want to honor you for this episode, Lord. We thank you that you prepare every mind, every heart, and every spirit, Lord, for the truth, because we know it's only the truth that can set us free. We honor you, Lord, and may your name be glorified through this series, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just want to share with you a bit of my own journey regarding depression. From a young age, from a little girl into my adult phase, and my whole entire life, my family saw these things I was going through, but nobody could diagnose it as depression. So a lot of us are going through certain things, experiencing things in, a, a, in our emotions, and we can't explain to people what's going on on the inside. As a girl, I was very introvert. I used to love locking myself up in my room and just being by myself. I always had this lie that nobody understood me, that I couldn't open up and share with anybody. So if I used to go through things in my emotional state, I wouldn't be able to speak to my mother or speak to my father or even to my sisters because I had this lie that opening up about these things, people are going to judge me. They're not going to understand. Maybe there's something wrong with me. But I couldn't mix with other people. People like so like my sister for example was a very social person I used to look at her life and I used to I used to wonder you know um, from my perspective what it would take for me to be that kind of person but I was I always used to judge myself according to other people's lifestyles according to other people's personalities and characters I couldn't understand the fact that I couldn't sit in normal conversations and social on a normal level and a lot of times people would make a joke about my kind of personality because they didn't understand it that I only come to understand as as well in a, the adult phase of my life so I went through from a little girl spending a lot of time on my, by myself and not really forming relationships not with my family members not with friends. There was a person here or there that I could actually communicate with. But in general, I was a person that was always in my own world. And I think that's something that a lot of people in depression suffer with. We, we build an imagination world. We build an imaginary world. And this is where the enemy comes. And this is where he starts feeding us. And this is where he starts building our future upon lies. This is where rejection comes in. This is where fear comes in. And we grow up just believing that we're in a world of our own. My mom always used to say to me that I'm in a world of my own, and it truly was that way. People, because they don't understand our personality type and our characters and what we're going through, usually avoid those kind of people. So we find that growing up in this kind of uh, environment or in this kind of the, uh, emotional state, that it's a very lonely walk. And um, that's exactly where the enemy wants us. The enemy wants us isolated. And this is what God wants to come and share with you through this teaching, through this message today, that it's not His will for you to be isolated. It's not the will of God for you to be alone. The Lord wants to walk with you. And He not only wants to walk with you, He's given you a body of believers. He's given you a family. Not just your biological family, because not all of us grow up in an ideal family life where there is a father, where there is a mother, where there is siblings. A lot of us grow up in environments that are very different. And I want to explain to you today that God has set up the heavenly places in the, uh, uh, um, in the form of family. God could have chosen to be any kind of God, but He chose to be a family God. And He had a son. And this is what God wants us to understand, that we are not intended to go through life alone. The problem with isolation is we become self-centered. And bear with me when I explain this to you. Because of, my, um, because of only being involved in my own life, my focus was constantly on myself. And this is the opposite of who Jesus was. Jesus' focus was on everything besides himself. Jesus' focus was on us. And, and because of Satan always trying to imitate everything about Jesus, he creates a false impression of what God's will is for us on earth. And this is something we are inbred. We are born into a sinful world. We are born into a carnal nature. You don't have to 
train people into what sin is. The, the carnal nature longs for things that aren't healthy for the body. The carnal man is always looking for things that aren't in the will of God because there's a spiritual realm that has an influence on us that is constantly leading us into temptation. That is why when we pray, we say, lead us not into temptation. It's not the will of God for us to constantly be seeking worldly satisfaction. And this is how the enemy works. He wants us constantly to satisfy the flesh. So we are in a world that is designed to satisfy the carnal man. And the... The difficult thing for us that are in, that used to, well, me that used to suffer depression, and a lot of you that are listening to this, that either are self-suffering depression, or have somebody in your family that you do not understand. My husband, I wrote a book on depression. My husband always used to joke and say that he's going to make, write a book on what it's like to live with somebody that has depression. So maybe today you're listening to this recording, and you yourself haven't suffered of it. But you are recognizing the personality traits in somebody in your household, maybe one of your children. I pray that God will use this and open your mind to, it, it's not self-inflicted. Even though your, your focus is constantly on yourself, this is not something that the man, you know, you don't wake up one day and say, this is how I want to be. So the enemy tries to create a false reality of what it is that we need to be of, you know, even the systems that we are involved in, in the schooling systems, in um, our government systems, in so many different worldly systems. We try and find our identity in those things. And this is the, one of the main causes of depression. It's lack of the identity in Christ Jesus. When we truly discover who we are, and this is what saved my life. It wasn't a theory. It wasn't 10 steps to get out of depression. It wasn't a book that I read um, that gave me a mind-blowing revelation. It was discovering the person that created me. It was discovering Jesus Christ. It was discovering God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So the will of God is actually very simple. God wants us to be in relationship with Him. He wants us to walk the walk that He's laid out before us since the beginning of time. The problem is the enemy keeps us blinded from these things. The enemy comes and paints a different picture for our future. We grow up believing that we need to be something that we were never designed to be. You know, most girls grow up believing that all they need to do is get married, have children. And then halfway into the... Um, Parenting or halfway into their marriage, they realize, but they're unfulfilled. They're not happy. And this is what happened to me. When I got married, I was still very young. I uh, came out of a very strict home. My father didn't allow us to experiment a lot on our own. He was very protective over us. So I went out of my household into my relationship in which I got married in. And I had kids at a very young age. And I had to have responsibility at a very young age. And this robbed me a lot of being a child in my own right of still being a young adult, of still experimenting in life and experiencing things that God wanted me to experience. So I became, I became saddled with responsibility that I wasn't emotionally mature enough to deal with. And because I was somebody that grew up with a depressed mindset and a self-centered mindset, the whole time in the early stages of our marriage, I was constantly mindful of what is happening that's against me, what has been stolen from me. Um, I remember blaming my husband time and time again uh, for making me pregnant as if it was something he did on his own. And I was just, I was always negative. It, the cup was always just half empty. Um, the money was never enough. Just, I was very unfulfilled. And I want to speak to you in a way that, you know, in a language that you can understand. I don't just want to sit here and uh, speak scripture and bring all these fancy teachings. I want to meet you today through this series, in a, where you are in your heart, where you can say, you know what, this is something I felt. When I was in my deepest, darkest hour, that's what, that's a chapter I've written in my book, it was my darkest hour. There was nothing any person, not my husband, not my children, any person on earth could do to fulfill me. I was constantly having suicidal thoughts. Um, nothing could, every, every uh, uh, happiness was a temporary happiness. I was constantly seeking happiness in the wrong things. And I reached a point in my life where I actually started turning to different crutches. Because I hadn't turned to the Holy Spirit and to Jesus, I didn't know. There was nobody that had come to me and told me that this is the answer to your depression. Nobody came and said to me, but Michelle, this is what you're experiencing. These, these thoughts, um, your personality, your character, these are all signs of somebody that is suffering from depression. That is, and because of being un, um, uneducated on this thing and unenlightened in this thing, I was constantly seeking a crutch in a different area. So at a, 
at, at, at about the age of 30, I started drinking. I thought that maybe this was the answer. Maybe, you know, or actually I didn't even care. I just wanted to do whatever was if I was feeling inside, every, every hurt and every um, bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. And because remember when you're depressed and you're self-absorbed, you see every person, every action that they do, you see it as an attack upon you as a person. What I want to share with you today is I want to share from a perspective of somebody that was wallowing in self-pity. It's so much easier for me to speak from my life as what it is to tell somebody that I counsel this and you're suffering from self-pity. I didn't have somebody that came and taught me from a young age what the will of God was over my life. I didn't, and I think that's for the most part of all of us. It's not a parent that didn't do it because they didn't want to do it. My parents weren't taught it either. So this is, a, this is like a snowball effect in generations of people growing up in a, a self-centered mindset and we go into families that way and we destroy each other. We destroy our husbands, we destroy our wives, we destroy our children because we constantly focus on ourselves. And this is not the will of God. Because God has raised us as His children in the kingdom, the moment you become a child of God, the moment you become reborn, your mindset changes. And something about you no longer wants to live for yourself. When you truly meet the King of Kings and you truly have an encounter with Him, you realize that life is so much more fulfilling when you live it laid down for somebody else. And that is the heart of what God wants to do through this series. Is He wants to open your eyes out of the bubble where you've encased yourself since a young age. And this is what happens from depression. It's not something that usually happens overnight. In next series, I'm going to be discussing more about the different kinds of depression, different levels of depression, the different kind of diagnosis around depression. But I just want to share from a practical point of view, because the more complicated we get about it, the chances of us healing from it is so much less. And when God just encountered me and He started showing me myself, God came into me through the Holy Spirit and He started revealing Himself to me. When I started seeing the heart of the Father, and I started comparing it to my life. I realized that this is where I've gone wrong. And uh, uh, slowly but surely the Holy Spirit started transforming me. In Titus 3 uh, verse 5 it says, By the washing of the water of the word and the regeneration of Holy Spirit. So God came into me and He started uh, showing me my relationship with my husband, my relationship with my children. And I started realizing, but you know, my focus had been on myself for so many years. I'd been married and I'd been a parent. But in relationship, I wasn't there. So I want to encourage you today that don't believe the lie of Satan. One of the biggest lies that Satan told me my entire life was that the world revolved around me. And because I was so self-centered as a child I, and going into my adult, uh, adult life, it was difficult for me to put somebody ahead of myself. So I would see my husband as a person that had to fulfill my life. I'd see my children as what is it that they could do to make my life better. And this was such a lie because at the end of the day, if I lived in the mindset of Christ, I'd be in my marriage saying, what can I do to fulfill my husband's life? What can I do to make his life better? And in what way could I serve my children? And unfortunately, I first had to end up as an alcoholic in rehab, uh, away from my children for three weeks, away from my husband to realize that I'd lived a life that the enemy had portrayed that was never the will of God for me. And I sat in this rehab and so many things happened in these three weeks. I remember the first day when I got there, I was sitting by my husband, I was crying, I was asking, just take me home, I don't want to be here. But there was a reason that God had me there. And I remember even in the time I was there, I wasn't in a spiritual relationship with God, but I remember myself constantly saying, God, why am I here? Why did you let this happen to me? Because even in that state, it was constantly still about me. I wasn't saying, God, how could I do this? How could I do this to my children? I remember my mom and my sisters coming to visit me there and leaving there in a state when they see me in the medicated state that I was in, crying all the way home. And I'd never once stop and think again, but what is this doing to them? Even in the three weeks that I was there, I was constantly in the mindset of myself. And I saw a lot of things there. I heard a lot of things. I realized a lot of things regarding depression. God showed me a few years after I'd come out of the rehab, when I started writing the book, a lot of the things that are happening behind the scenes in the medical world with depression. And God really opened my eyes. But the, the, the encounter with the Lord is what changed my life. When my eyes, for the first time, was taken off myself, when my perspective changed for the first time, 
and I started living for somebody besides myself. God took me through a time where He just revealed to me in such a gentle way. God doesn't come and show us things and make us feel condemned. Because remember, already when you're in depression, you're not in a healthy mindset. But the Lord encountered me. I was sitting one day on the step of our swimming pool and I, I was highly medicated. I didn't want to live like that anymore. Because even though I wasn't getting anger outbursts, I was living a very dead life. I couldn't still be a mom to my children. My emotions were dead. My emotional area of my life was dead. I couldn't be emotionally there for my husband. So it was a very, um, it was a very cold life. And I was sitting on the swimming pool and I said, God, if this is my only answer, if this, is my, if this medication is the only answer and the only hope that I have, and this is the way I'm going to live for the rest of my life, then I no longer want to live. And I remember sitting on the end of the swimming pool and just wanting to fall back and drown. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit encountered me for the first time. And God Himself saved my life. There was no person involved. There was no pastor involved. There was no sermon involved or teaching involved. It was the Lord Himself that encountered me that day. And I know the Lord wants to encounter each and every one of us that way. But God used me to come and bring this teaching in the, the plainest way that I know how, in the, the, the simplest terms that I can, and even to expose myself on, uh, on video to say to you that it's not something to be ashamed of. Don't keep, let the enemy keep you um, captive through this lie. Stop feeling embarrassed about your depression. Because the enemy will keep you there till the day that you, want to, you don't want to live anymore. And that is why there's so much suicide in the world today. Because we, we're too ashamed to come out and just open up towards somebody and say, you know, this is what I'm experiencing. I'm, I'm negative every day. I want to sleep all the time. Um, I can't, uh, you know, my eating patterns have changed. You know, we see things in our lives change and we see we see things aren't normal when I used to look at my sister and look at other people I'd say something about me is just not normal and it wasn't not normal in a good way as we as Christians are set apart it was something that wasn't normal in the will of God and that is what I want to encourage you with this series I want to say let's just get a, get to a point where we say we can be open and real with each other you know, I'd look at so much teachings and I'd look at these things and it just was so it was above my head I didn't understand these things I want to speak to you in a language that everybody can understand regarding the carnal man, regarding the emotional area of man. And I would never come, from a, uh, never come and teach you on something that I myself hadn't been through. And it's not just about a testimony of what I've been through, but it's actually overcoming that's the testimony. And I can really say today that the Lord Himself brought me out of this pit. And he taught, He's teaching me even today, every day, He's journeying with me to stay out of the pit. It's a daily journey with the Lord. Romans 2, uh, 12 verse 2 says to us, Don't be conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the daily renewal of your mind. And that is my prayer for you and each and every person listening and every person that you can share this with, that there is hope. And the Word says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So my heart is that the Lord comes through this message and He really inspires something inside of you, that He ignites a hope inside of you again, so that you can find Him and you can discover your God-ordained purpose on earth. Because I want to I want to tell you that I'm sitting here today in a position where I can share with you, because I'm a living testimony of God saving a life out of the point of suicide, of out of the point of selfishness, out of the point of my 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 whole, the the absence of the reason that God uh, designed me. I just briefly like to share one of the things I experienced when I was in depression rehab. And it's not to influence anybody against going to a rehabilitation center. It's just to say that in my experience there, I didn't come out more educated about depression. I was exposed to a lot of different forms of depression there. But I was also treated medically every single day for uh, 21 days with different kind of medication. What would happen is I would be called in by the psychiatrist and they'd ask me, did I have any side effects from the medication? According to my answer, they would adjust my medication. So by the time I left there, my body was uh, busy responding negatively to the medication. But I had had two brown paper, paper bags full of medication and legally I was medicated with eight different tablets before I left the house to carry on my normal day-to-day -day, uh, uh, responsibilities. And even with my children, you know, they'd see me take these tablets and they would see the way I wouldn't respond as a normal mother would respond. I wouldn't respond as a normal wife would respond. I was in, if I could put it in the plainest terms, I was almost like a, I was almost comatose. Uh, I remember one day getting into my car, riding to go to visit my mother and my sister was riding behind me. 
and my car actually went off the road. And this was on medication that I was given by a psychiatrist. So I left the rehabilitation center with my tablets believing that I'd have to be on it because this is what was told to me by the professionals. I'd be on this for the rest of my life. So I believed this, I accepted the diagnosis, I didn't know any better. And I want to encourage you to double think a life sentence that's given to you. Don't just accept something for yourself because it's given to you by somebody that's professional and has studied over these things. You must understand the will of God according to the word is that we be sober minded and vigilant every day. When I was in the clinic there was a young lady that was my roommate and she battled very a, a, a clinical kind of depression. She had been treated with electroshock therapy and her fiance was in the accident while we were there and she got the uh, news that her fiance died in this accident. The first thing they did for the first two days of her treatment after this news is to remove her from the, uh, remove the tablets from her. And I still remember going to the nurse and saying to her, listen, you need to give this girl something because she's crying uncontrollably. And the nurse will said to me, we're removing the pulse so that the emotions can come out. And I never thought of it again that day. But when I started writing the book, two years later, the Lord revealed to me that uh, the medication comes and suppresses our emotions. And that's why we don't get aggressive anymore. We don't have outbursts of anger or we don't have outbursts of emotions. But we actually become dormant emotionally. And I want to say something to you today that I never ever got suicidal like I was when I was on the tablets. And I know this might be something that people do not want to hear. I've ministered at a lot of conferences where people have actually got up and walked out of the conference. But I want to tell you something today. Be open-minded and be let your spirit man be open for what I want to share with you. When I was not on the tablets, when the emotions kicked in, when I felt suicidal, the, the Holy Spirit immediately ministered to me. Whether or not He was inside of me, there was always something, we always recognize it as our conscience, that kick, kicks in and stops us from wanting to go that far. The closest I've ever come to ending my life was when I was on these tablets and felt that I had no emotion. And I said to myself, if this is the life I need to live for the rest of my life, I don't want to live this way. God has, in, uh, God has asked us to live a sober life because when the enemy, when we are medica medicated, the enemy comes in and he can plant any kind of lie that he wants. And it says here in 1 Peter 5 verse 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The enemy waits for us to be... That's why you'll find a lot of medication today has something inside of it that affects our way of thinking or our, uh, the soberness of our mind. And I'm not saying that medication is wrong in any way. In fact, if I have the flu, I still use something for my flu. What I am trying to say is a dependence on medication that makes you not sober-minded and no longer in control of your emotional area is a very dangerous place to be. So I want to encourage you today, if you are on depression medication, to please pray about it. Surrender it to the Lord. I've seen a lot of people, including myself, successfully permanently leave depression medication and I'm, I will never insist that somebody leaves the uh, medication on their own but I found that the more I allowed the Holy Spirit to infiltrate my spirit man, my soul my man and also my uh, emotional area of my life, the less I needed a dependency on anything else because my alcohol had led me to the rehabilitation center but I didn't leave not addicted to something anymore. I left addicted to something that was legal and that I could actually go to work intoxicated without being fired. So I want to I wanna encourage you today that if you are on this, um, on this medication, please surrender it to the Lord and ask the Lord to help you and to show you, must you be on this medication or not? Ask the Lord to lead you and guide you through the Holy Spirit. And let the Holy Spirit counsel you in every area because the Lord doesn't want us dependent on anything besides Himself. I just want to share also something that I want to leave with you. King David was a king. He was in charge of our whole land. And he still knew his dependence on the Lord. I want to read to you something. When King David was going through a, a very difficult time and his enemies wanted to see him dead, 
he reached out to the Lord and it was so amazing for me to see how he said, on you alone I depend. Read with me uh, Psalm 62 from verse 5. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. And this is something that I just knew I could take in the time that I was going through the struggle with, the, uh, with depression, is that I was never alone. Because people do get tired of hearing your story. People do get tired of hearing you complain. And the people that are there for you in the beginning eventually do fade. And not, not because they want to, but because they don't have the answers. They don't know how to help you. So I want to encourage you to turn to God. He's designed you. He's engineered you. And He knows what it takes to heal you. Thank you very much for watching. If you could just join us now for our closing prayer. Thank you, Father. We just want to honor you, Father, for every word that went out now, for every incorruptible seed that is Jesus Christ, Lord. And I thank you for every heart, every mind, and every spirit that was opened now, Father God, for your ministering. And Father, we just want to glorify you through this in Jesus' name. Please come and join us next week as we continue with the series of depression. Let your rain pour down let your rain pour down, let your rain pour down over me. Showers from above, fall.